Hello everyone, this is Devin Thorpe for Crowdcast's RegD TV, and I'm excited to have with us today on this new series, Jerry Freeman, uh, the CEO and founder of Palette App. Uh, Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Devin. I appreciate being here. Well, it's really our privilege, and we thank you for taking the time. Tell us a little bit about what Palette App is so that we can quickly frame our discussion. Sure. Um, Tamara and I both come from the architectural design community and manufacturing, and our industry has basically been using an analog system for about 150 years. And what we're doing is we're basically digitizing architectural materials, which allow architects, designers, general contractors, subcontractors, furniture dealers to e easily and quickly find materials for projects, find the specification, uh, get samples, and create uh, project binders and, and spec documents. Uh, so we're basically digitizing the design libraries for architects, designers, and uh, the manufacturers in our industry. So this is stuff like carpets, paints, uh, wall coverings, fabrics for furniture, all that kind of stuff you can access in through Pallet App. Is that right? Yeah, we're building that database now. And so all the materials you just mentioned happen to be in the database. But it's everything. So it's also bricks uh, that you'll see on the exterior of a building. It's concrete. It's the bicycle racks you see out front. It's the light posts. It's uh, plumbing fixtures, uh, commercial kitchen equipment. It's everything in what's called a CSI library, which is a construction systems index. Uh, so it's basically the world that we all live in and how we choose those materials. So if I'm designing, say, a pool complex for a, a city or a state uh, municipality, uh, and I need to find the materials to uh, you know, clean uh, and filter the pool, uh, you'll be able to eventually find those on our site. Uh, so it's for it's all different types of design types. So the uh, there's got to be huge demand for this uh, because this is a little bit late, right? Oh. We've been using the internet now for uh, 20 years. Yeah. The uh, and the construction industry has been sort of ripe for this. For at least 15 years, people have been trying to figure this out. So there's got to be huge demand. Or is that what you're seeing? No, actually, we, we see quite a bit of demand. Design firms have been wanting something like this for upwards of 20 years. Uh, the challenge has been the monitors. Uh, when, we, when we show fabric on the site, the resolution of the monitor has to be good enough to give the designer or architect a good enough image of the product to be able to see if they want to have a physical sample. Uh, and the monitors only have become good enough really in the last four or five years. So from a data standpoint, the technology has been there, but from a monitor standpoint, they really haven't had the ability to, to see it. And monitors that were high resolution five years ago were three, four $4,000, and today they're under $1,000. So it's much more reasonable. And everything we're doing, we're developing for iPads and all, all mobile devices. Uh, and those monitors themselves are really high quality, uh, especially the retinal type displays. And so those are better than some of a lot of the routine monitors most of us use on our computers, aren't they? Yeah, much much better. And so uh, if I can look on my iPad or I can look on uh, Google's uh, mobile device, I can really get a good sense of what that material looks like before I order a sample. So that's really been the hindrance: is, is the technology to not only see it, but also the technology to put that uh, information into a database because it's a tremendous amount of, of data. Because you're not only indexing this information, but you also have to archive at least images as well as, I would imagine, other data points about it, right? Well, what we do is we've created a series of proprietary filters for all types of products. So let's take art as an example. If you were to print out our R filters at 8-point font, they're actually 50 pages long. And so it allows somebody to go in. So if I'm working with a law firm, which is what I used to design, and uh, I want to find an original piece of art, let's say a uh, sculpture, uh, for an outdoor plaza, I can actually go in our system, put in the type of material I want, put that it's for outdoor use, put in the dimensions of what I want, the type of theme that I want, and the material of, so let's say, marble, and it will show me what's available on our site for that type of use. And then once I have this kind of data, I can actually create what's called a palette, uh, a palette of finishes. And a typical job will have anywhere from 25 to 35 different products used as a palette. And once that material is in a in palette form, I can click a single button, order all the samples at once, I can download all the specifications at once, I can create what's called a project binder, which typically used to take a designer about four or five days to compile. We can do it in about 10 minutes. Wow. Uh, Huge. So that information really, really, 
Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the business. Uh, what What is the revenue model? How do you generate uh, cash from, from <laughs> this database? But, you know, it's a common question, especially from our investors. So we look at different ways of generating revenue. Uh, the database is key, and so we have sort of a freemium model there. The site's usable by anybody uh, that's a professional architect or designer or, or sort of in our trade, uh, and then we create tools off of that. So the first tool we're introducing is something called Powered App Rep, and we're introducing that this Neocon. And so to give you an idea of how that works, we can save the typical uh, manufacturer's rep about 26 business days a year. Uh, the process for them to, to manage samples and to manage their project information is very time uh, time uh, constraint. And so uh, when a designer goes in and meets with a rep and orders a bunch of samples, we can actually do it in about a tenth of the time. Uh, and then we can store that data into a database or a CRM for that rep. Uh, so that's the first tool, and that's a, that's a subscription-based model. The second one is the project binder tool I mentioned. And so these binders are created not only by architects and designers, but also by general contractors as part of their closeout documents. And those take four or five days to make uh, although I did meet with the GC recently, we mentioned it sometimes takes as much as a month to get all the data. Uh, again, we can do it in about 10 minutes because we have the database. Uh, those are the tools we're introducing this year. Uh, next year, we'll start introducing other tools, uh, color forecasting tools for manufacturers. So when they do make a product, they can actually go in and see in real time uh, what colors are being chosen. We've already had uh, well over a million palettes created on our site. So we have thousands of designers on the site every day clicking on colors and looking at product, and so we can help a manufacturer understand the direction that the color is going to take. Uh, because if you're going to introduce a book in three or four months, having the right colors is key. Uh, it can either make or break a product style for sure, you. Sure. So what what are you uh, are you at this stage of the game? Are you generating revenue, or is there cash flow coming in from customers, whether it's advertisers or or fee based customers? No, not right now. We're not a marketing site, and that's key. Architects and designers want options. They don't want to be sold. And so we take no advertising dollars at all. In fact, we have banner ads that we have manufacturers asked to purchase a placement on. We don't offer that. We have a weekly email that uh, Tamara and her team puts together. That goes out to thousands of designers every week. We get about a 27% open rate. Again, manufacturers want to buy placement on that. We don't offer that. Uh, we do have manufacturers now paying us to basically build what's called a spider, and that spider allows us to crawl their site and pull the data we need to load it into our system. Uh, but it's a one-time fee. Uh, so the rep tool really will become the first uh, continuous revenue stream for the site. And we'll do that, like I said, around June, June 9th. As you look at your projections, how do you see the revenue of the business growing over the next three to five years? What, what does the ramp up look like? Where does the revenue come from? And what kinds of numbers are you anticipating? Well, from the rep app, uh, from the uh, project binder tool, and so to give you an idea, just the project binder tool alone, we generate just in the U.S. Uh, 1.6 million of these binders every year, uh, and we ch we're going to charge $500 a binder. Uh, so that's an $800 million potential revenue stream for us. Uh, so it's a much bigger market than most people realize, uh, which is the challenge for some investors. Most investors have never worked within our industry, and so they're a little bit uh, leery of working outside of things they kind of know. Uh, when we look at our, our uh, affiliate marketing, uh, so we will be selling some products on the site uh, starting next year. Uh, we get requests about four or five a day from, from subcontractors and people who want to purchase products from the site. Uh, in the U.S., again, we'll spend $57 billion on architectural materials just in the U.S., and so we'll garner a piece of that. Uh, we have users right now in about 1,400 cities in the U.S., but we also have users in 200 cities and 59 other countries outside the U.S. Uh, we haven't started any marketing campaigns yet. This has all been word of mouth. Uh, so come June when we start doing the rep app, we'll start marketing. And we, have anticip we anticipate moving into the European market and the Canadian market uh, in 2015. So those numbers will just grow. Uh, so we see scaling up from, from uh, revenue this year of a, a few million dollars to revenue in about five years, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $125 million. Wow, that's, that uh, really is a, a rapid ramp. It, it, that, that explains how you were drawn into this. Uh, tell me a little bit about the formation of the company and the history of it uh, so people understand where this came from. Well, you know, as I mentioned, I'm an architect and designer uh, by profession. I spent 10 years designing law firms, corporate headquarters, uh, retail spaces. Uh, I worked for Genzo for a number of years and then I helped, uh, I worked at two startup car, uh, design firms. 
I left there to help uh, start a company called Envision Carpet, which is a carpet mill. Uh, and after about five and a half years there, I left and went to start uh, work with another startup carpet mill. So I have about 16 years on the manufacturing side. And the frustration I kept seeing was the amount of time designers and architects waste when they're looking for product. Uh, the physical space within their own uh, offices. Right now, all this data is stored in, in sample books. And they just don't have the space. So you'd walk into a design firm, uh, show them product, and they'd say, well, you've got about eight inches of shelf space, and you have you know, seven feet of product you want to put in eight inches. And so it's a challenge for the manufacturer. And what sort of really broke the, the straw was uh, seeing hundreds of these books and thousands of samples being thrown out. We ship 300 million samples every year in just the U.S., and over 70% of those get thrown in the trash every year. And so I just got tired of seeing that. And so with Tamara's help, who come from the residential design side, uh, who helped me start some uh, uh, sustainable flooring products uh, after we left Mohawk together, uh, we built this tool. And so we've been continually growing our, our uh, team. And um, you know we're ready to really scale the business now. We've proven the model. Uh, we're actually getting close to finishing our first round of funding. Uh, and we're ready to expand. We're loading another 125 manufacturers right now. We're scaling the database right now to hold a million products and 10,000 users at one time. Uh, we're actually in the process of moving everything to a cloud-based system uh, so that the pages will load more quickly uh, because our users have no patience. Uh, they have no time. <laughs> and so that's kind of where we came from and kind of where we're going. Well, this is uh, really interesting. Uh, Jerry, tell us a little bit about how your the process of raising money and where you are in that process. I think you've got a listing on uh, early shares. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, we do. We, we, you know, every, we, you know, we started talking to angel investors, and we, our raise was uh, sort of larger than angel, but smaller than VC. So that was a challenge. So if you're going to raise money, the first thing I do is determine how much you need to get started. Our biggest challenge was we couldn't launch a tool to generate revenue until we built the database, which is a very costly endeavor. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably go out and raise three to five million. I probably would be done. Uh, but we're in that sort of no man land of under three million, but over a half a million. So we're sort of too large for angels and too small for VCs. And so we've kind of cobbled it together uh, through multiple things. We have angel investors. Uh, we do have two venture fund investors. Uh, and everybody requires you to be on a sort of a different site to put all the data and information. Um, and we stumbled upon early shares. We were approached by them and about four or five other crowdfunding platforms, and we found them to be um, great to work with. Uh, when we did some research on the other companies we looked at, uh, they either had no experience raising money or uh, they really had no experience uh, building a database or building a, a site that was usable. And also a big challenge for us was the reach. You know, how many people are going to reach? If it's going to only be 1,000, 1,200 people, that's really not useful for us. And like I said, early shares has been great. It took us a while to get up. We were, I think, the first or second one launched on the site. Uh, so there was a lot of learning curve with us, uh, which I think is probably they're over that now. Uh, but it's been helpful. I mean, we've actually gotten uh, some investment activity through them. Uh, and, and so it's been really helpful for me. Even with the people that I meet with locally here, I can send them to early shares to look at the information. What I was having to do before was I would have to post on Dropbox, you know, a shared file. I would have to update that. Uh, we have uh, offerings on six different sites that I have to keep current based on the different angel groups, which is really a challenge for us. It's really easier now just to go to early shares, update everything there, and then send everybody to that platform. Uh, so that's been helpful. They've been also really good about getting our name out there uh, to potential uh, groups. In fact, I was on the phone with a potential investor yesterday that found us because of a posting that early shares made. Um, so. That, that part's been really good. What's been really interesting is we have been in communication with some of the larger uh, venture funds here in Chicago and didn't get a lot of activity with them because we were too small. But once we launched on our crowdfunding platform, they actually reached out to us and they've been asking us questions. And they felt the frustration because they see companies like ours that they're, they're just too small to invest in, but they want to see them get a good enough runway to grow because they want to invest in that sort of B round where they invest three, five, ten million dollars, and so I've had some very interesting conversations with those guys because there's really a void for companies like ours, and we think crowdfunding is going to be the way to go. I don't think it's there today. Uh, I think if you're raising a half million dollars, you're probably uh, more apt to do it more quickly than than where we are. Uh, 
Uh, How much exactly are you trying to raise? You've kind of hinted at that, but what's your goal? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, our, our first round, we actually, uh, when we started out about a year and a half ago, we were looking to raise a million and a half. Uh, we had a board meeting last week, and given the cost savings that we've been able to implement, uh, we've started to do things smarter uh, because we're learning as we go with some of this data entry when it comes to the manufacturers. Uh, we've been able to save money, and we actually can now get to uh, where we start generating cash flow and cover our expenses at with a million dollar raise. So we're lowering our raise to a million dollars and we're actually, like I said, we're getting close to, to hitting that number. Uh, right. So that, that's our current raise. We know we'll have to go out for our next round. Uh, when we go global, I mean that's just, you know, unless the site really takes off very quickly, uh, probably the next four to six months we'll go out and raise another three to five million to go global. Uh, but I think that's that's kind of where we are. And, I, and it's, that's fairly traditional. I mean when you get to the scale and you start growing, uh, then you know that next round to really scale it fast is where we are, and we're getting we're probably two three months away from that. No, well, fantastic. Well, Jerry, I really appreciate you taking time to be oh, with us today. Pleasure. Now, tell us a little bit more. Let's be clear with people if they're interested in investing. Where do they go? What do they do? How do they get in touch? Uh, they can go on Early Shares. Uh, so if you go to earlyshares.com, I think it's backslash projects backslash Paladin. Uh, but if you go to Early Shares and look at their homepage, you'll see us pop up, and you can click on that. Uh, if you're an accredited investor, you basically fill out some generic information uh, or general information, and uh, you can send me a, a request to see our information, and we, you know, we just accept you, and you're good to go. It's pretty simple from that standpoint. We had a potential investor who was very leery about it, actually, just this week, and when I walked him through and said, "Well, your information is not really public," which was a big concern of his, um, he emailed me back. So this was easy. This was great. I got everything I need. Uh, I'll call you. We'll set up a phone conversation next week. So that part has been really helpful. That's great. That's just terrific. Yeah. Well, uh, Jerry, again, thank you for your time today. Uh, I wish you every success in your uh, crowdfunding efforts and uh, your fundraising, and I uh, hope you will be uh, fabulously successful. Well, Dave, Devin, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Now let's do some good.